I would like to uh, try something tonight and uh, I think you'll find it very curious but likely <coughs> no more or less curious than some of the other things we've done. So now notice what I'm doing. I'm going to ignore this entirely and come back to it much later. Grades of reality. All we're going to talk about for a while is the problem of relations, relationships. There are only two things in the universe. There are only things and things related to one another. So therefore, there are only things and relations. Philosophy, as I understand it, has a key interest in study of relations. So all we're going to do is see whether we can develop a vocabulary to talk about relations, that's all. Now, in order to do that, you can see two wonderful people there and have to give them names and uh, I think I'll give the name um, Sarah. And as you can see, there's a certain gentleman who's interested in Sarah. We have to give a name. And I'm going to give a name, which will be, um, <coughs> pardon me, Curious name, Manny. All right? Now, anything that is, if it is at all, anything that is, if it is at all, it must have a certain power to be what it is. It's chalk. To be what it is, there must be some kind of cohesiveness, power, that keeps it together. So I'm going to submit that three kinds of power that we'll talk about today. Internal, external, and potential. Let's see if we can do it. Would you agree Manny is in now is in pursuit of Sarah. To be in pursuit, would you not agree, necessarily, that there must be some idea in his head? We'll even get a darker pen. Agree? No idea, no relationship. That is, he must have some reason to reach out. Now, would you agree that's the cause of this relationship as he pursues it? He doesn't know how far he's going to go. And we'll even go a step further and tie it down. Good. So, that's the cause. That's the cause. That's an idea that he wants to fulfill. Would you agree, even though he has the idea, well, 
I mean, if he doesn't have any power to pursue this, he's not going to go very far without power. Ah, good, good, good. And that power must involve some activity. And therefore, he is now going to involve himself in a certain activity. And that activity itself has a power. Well, he had to have that power before pursuing Sarah. Therefore, there had to be in here, right, a certain what we're going to call potential power for the relationship. And it's because of that potential power that he has, then he can act it out. Ah, he can act it out. Then what do we have? We have an internal power, because he has to be what he is, he has to keep himself together. So he certainly has <clears throat> a great internal power, keeps himself together, keeps all of his goals in mind and the way in which he wants to proceed. And then, that's a surplus because with that he's going to act out and that's what we mean by the external. And he must have had that power in somehow in reserve in order, in order to enter into this relationship. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Sarah. I mean, to be possessed by Manny, she had to agree to it. She had to agree to it. She had to be willing to receive these advances. Agree? Must be willing to receive the advance. And she knows that with that, she's going to have to, in some way, to some degree, reciprocate herself. And therefore, there's going to have to be from herself a certain power for her to interact. So equally well, would you not agree, she too must have had a certain potential power. And she couldn't have done that had she not had some sense that the idea she has in mind is akin in some way to his idea. Otherwise, all kinds of consequences follow. So, we can also talk just about Sarah herself, of course. We can just talk about her herself apart from this relationship. And we can talk about Manny apart from his relationship to Sarah. Now, what else can we understand by just looking at this most important thing, which is what, what is a relationship? And why are we doing it? Well, let's go a step further. I wonder whether you'll go along with the following curious reasonings. Where this relationship is going, where this relationship is going, where it's going, which is, well, let's say that for the sake of which they got together, see, I mean, the whole reason that they got together was because there was some mutuality. Now, notice this now. 
Is this true then? The cause that brought them together, which is really that idea is identical with the cause of its existence. The idea is identical with the cause of its existence. That idea is the cause of the existence of them coming together. Agree? I mean, if they now have a relationship, then that relationship exists, doesn't it? All right, the relationship now exists. Let's bring them a little closer. All right. Now, the cause of that relationship was that Manny had an idea, and by the way, it turned out that he acted it out, it perhaps awakened an idea in Sarah. But the cause of that whole relationship is nothing other than that that idea, which is, is now directing all of his actions, to which she must necessarily respond in a similar way, with comparable power, right, activity, potential interest in the relationship, then the cause, the basic cause of that relationship is no other than the cause of its existence is nothing other than, than, that, than that cause. So the cause of the existence of the relationship It's nothing other than that, we can call it final cause. What I mean by final cause is that for the sake of which they got together in the first place. So there they are, they're now together. We can now talk about the existence of that relationship. It depends upon uh, a certain cause that cause then had to have uh, play a, a positive role. It had to have some power. There had to be some activity that, re that, that was a consequence of that power. There has to be a power to that activity. <coughs> and in that involvement, they are then acting out, would you not agree? Ideally, they're acting out what lies potentially in this idea. This idea is, as it were, let's say, a broad plan, purpose. Now, of course, once that broad plan and purpose is no longer acceptable, then the relationship ends, for whatever reason. Now, look here. Something else about this. I wonder whether we can use this sentence. The cause, the idea, it remains within the activity of its cause. Look at this. <coughs> See, would you not agree, in everything he does, Nonetheless, there's something that remains within himself. That's the idea. It remains there. And in the activity, in the activity, in the activity, everything that he and she does, right, in the activity of that cause, it's nothing other than what remains within that idea. Now, oh. 
in one sense, uh, it has an existence just as an idea, but in acting out, in acting out the idea, <coughs> they are departing from it in acting out the idea. They depart from it. Yet, it's the source of their very existence. Let's look at it again. Would you not agree that the degree to which they can become involved in other things, I want to consider that as these figures here, right. to separate it from the other, that he may then, oh, do something else, not necessarily consistent with that original idea, and she too may want to turn it to s in some other direction. But in terms of the original goal, if they return to it, if they return to it, agree to it, and allow it to be acted out, well then that's a standard of perfection. Their perfection, what they've agreed to, right? So therefore, it's it, returning to this cause, well, it's the very goal of perfection. Because we can talk about how, as it were, how how successful the relationship is if we just ask to what degree are they acting out all of the implications of that plan. If they're acting it out with the full force of their being, then we can measure their relationship <coughs> at least internally by that very standard. Therefore, it's quite obvious that every relationship involves the transference of power. No transference of power, no relationship. Therefore, this whole thing is nothing other than a transference, back and forth, transference of power. Now, there's something curious now that each of these people, again, let us assume, uh, they can keep their goal, which is the very condition of their existence, in mind as they do whatever it is they do. Then in a very interesting way, they become like that goal. They're molding themselves, as it were, to be like it. <coughs> Therefore, it's necessary that in such relationships a similarity emerges. That is to say, each of these people are trying to craft themselves. They don't have to do it consciously, but everything they're doing in respect to what they want is, as it were, molding themselves after that, that idea. And therefore, they become like great idea of likeness. They become very much like the very cause. Now look what we have here. We could call her, for a moment, the effect. And we could speak of him as the primary cause of the relationship. Now, the cause is similar in its activity. The cause is similar in its activity. <coughs> the cause, this idea, he is now going to act out. Agree? He is going to act out. Using that as a model. He is going to act out, and in that action, that's his model. 
But look here. Then the cause is similar in its activity, and the activity is similar to the effect. Ah, let's go back, take a look at it again. The cause, that idea, is similar, is similar in its very activity because it's going to be used as a model. There's going to necessarily be a likeness then between acting out and the model. The activity is similar to the effect. See, if he's acting in this way and she accepts that way of acting, then doesn't it equally follow that the effect is having, the activity is similar to the effect? Because of one thing. The model, the model is a potential source for everything they do. For the potential is there. See? It becomes similar because it always contains potentially within itself the model. It strives to be like the model. <clears throat> it acts in every way in order for that to emerge. So necessarily follows that out of such relationships a likeness and similarity emerges. Now look here, have to change a bit, introduce a new word, two new words. Instead of talking about Sarah and Manny, everything we've said is not any different than this problem. Here is Manny, the mind. Here is soul. Sarah, participating in mind. We have a relationship with our mind. All of the formal properties that you can study in relationships can be equally explored in terms of within ourselves, within ourselves, we have a relationship with our own mind. No, that's rather peculiar. Which has which? Which is the cause and which is the effect? Does the mind, does the mind possess the soul? Participate in the soul? Or does the soul participate in the mind? As you look at this beautiful diagram, could you decide just by the diagram? Could you say the mind is participating in the soul? There it is. Could you equally say the soul is participating in the mind? Implications always go reverse. If you say it one way, you can say it equally well the other. So any implication of A to B is equally true to B to A. So what are we going to do? I mean, do I possess a mind or does the mind possess me? What's going on? This is rather peculiar. Is one active and the other not? Ah, pardon me. Let's try it. Now, we're not going to do anything different than we did with Manny and Sarah. We can go right back and talk about each one of the things we talked about before, and we can introduce it in the same way, using the very same ideas, because all relationships must contain the same kinds of categories. So let's first see what it might be like when we substitute soul and mind. Each soul can only know if it possesses its own mind. Right.
In truth, only Sarah can know if she possesses many. Now the mind which is possessed by a soul is the cause of its being able to know. Now look here. When Manny is possessed by Sarah, that's the cause of their being able to know. If possessed by, participate in, all right, can be said of this relationship. Let's try it. When Manny is possessed by Sarah, well, that's the cause of their being able to know one another. <clears throat> unless she's willing to participate, obviously, there would be no way in which they could be said to know one another. Put it back now in terms of the mind. Every soul can only know if it possesses its own mind. The mind which is possessed by the soul is the cause of its being able to know would you agree? If you have a, do you have a, a mind? It's through the mind that you're able to know. Right? It's through the mind that you are able to know. If you're able to know, then the soul has some, a mind which is then allows it to able to know. Then would you not agree there must be a cause for it? There must be some power for it to know? There must be some activity. There must be some power to its activity. There must be some potential power for its activity to function the way it is. And there must be something in itself. Ah. Now, remember we were caught on this dilemma. Which is it? Is it just that we could equally say the soul possesses the mind and the mind possesses the soul, or which is the cause or which is the effect, doesn't make any difference since it goes back and forth. One implies the other. Or is there some superiority of one over the other and where does it hold? Well, Manny had the power <clears throat> to give of himself to Sarah. Agree? Without that, be no relationship. He had the power to give himself to Sarah, which is the power, which is the power to be possessed by Sarah if she accepts him. She may not accept it, but if she accepts it, then that's a relationship. Then it's the mind that gives itself to the soul, and so it has the power to know. Then that means, you see. It's not the soul that has the power to give itself to the mind in order to know. Therefore, it is not reversible. It is not reversible. Therefore, the mind is the cause, the primary cause, and therefore has more power, and therefore has a more privileged position. Because it has the power to give of itself to the soul so that now the soul can know. <clears throat> this is sometimes described in that great moment in history, right, when human beings first came into possession of language, whether it was sign language or verbal language. At that moment, at that moment, something had to awake. The mind had to awake in a totally new way. It had to be there potentially. There must have been something that had to stir it up. There must have been some activity that proceeded, that awoke it, <coughs> that brought it from being just an internal potential power 
to emerge outward and fulfill its potential. Therefore, the mind has a vast potential. It has an internal power to remain in itself, to function within itself. It also has an activity that proceeds from it as it seeks to know. That itself has a power. <coughs> now, what can we do with this? Notice, every time we're making any statements, we go back to Manny and, and Sarah, don't we? <coughs> he had to have the direction. He made the step, right? First, he had to be contained within himself, had to have a certain power, internal power, had to be willing to go external. He had to fulfill an idea in his own mind. He had to win, win, then gather the necessary power for that activity to, to proceed. He had to be willing to act out on the model that he had that then allowed a relationship to emerge. She, on the other hand, notice we can talk about the same thing, as she's the possessor. Right? We can talk about uh, her as a possessor in the same way we can talk about the soul then, possesses mind, right? it possesses mind, and now it can function through knowing. Now, big step now, here we go. Now, mind, if it has power, if it has power and an activity proceeds from it, if it has power, and if it has an activity that proceeds from it, anything that has a power, remember what we said, any, anything at all must have a power in order, in order to be. And if it then has more than an in internal power, has an external power, then it has an activity. Well then, if mind then has a power in activity, then you can say, you know what? It exists. Now, I don't want to use the word exist. I want to use another word which is similar to it. <coughs> it has being, which is a fancy word for exist. Therefore, mind exists. <coughs> but by the way, also the soul the soul that possesses the mind, it too has a power, it too has an activity, it too can be a cause, therefore it too has being. Or exists. Therefore, hey, all the souls that possess mind have being and all souls. Well, they know what that also means? That means all individual minds, all individual minds that are possessed by each soul, they must have being too. Huh. Well, look here. Notice what we have now. We can now extend this. <coughs> right? And we could repeat the same thing, right? Mind, 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 soul. So now we can say, all the souls that possess mind, they have being, and all the individual minds, and all the individual minds has being. Well, there's really a great statement. I wonder whether I wrote it down. Ah, okay, give me a chance to talk about it.
It's a great statement of Proclus. And I have found a way of expressing it today that's somewhat different, so I'd like to use it. I got this in a coffee shop. So let's see whether you notice something curious about it. I'm going to see whether this can be said to be a principle. See, each one of these minds gives itself to a soul. Each one of these minds, we've been saying, since we say it for one thing, we can say it for all. Then, everything then which gives such a thing to others must, ah, here it is, must be that must be that which it gives to others. Now that's, notice this is very abstract. So everything, whatever it is, must be that which it gives to others. So anything that gives something to others freely It must be that which it gives to others. So that, let's try it now. All right, that's my big statement. If the mind, the individual mind, gives itself to each soul, then we're saying, then there must be something called mind, independent of all minds, independent of all particular minds, since it is what gives to all the others that which itself it possesses primarily. Is it possible that all teaching fulfills this condition? A music teacher, math teacher, or a language teacher. If that teacher can give to others that which it possesses, would you not agree, no matter how much it gives to the others, the teacher has more than he gives or she gives. No matter how much you give, there's always connections and meanings that you've come to that you can't, you can't simply disclose it all because it may be too obvious for you. Therefore, whatever the teacher gives to others, the teacher itself contains that primarily. Music, dance, cooking, anything. And has it in a more, in a more fundamental way Right, more fundamental way. And necessarily contains it more perfectly. Therefore, from this reasoning, we would say there's a basis for saying mind then exists and it then gives to souls the various individual aspects of itself, which it possesses more fundamentally and more perfectly and must exist prior and must be prior. And we can now reflect and say now, therefore, all mind has being 
I'll put a B next to it, right? As well as the soul that possesses minds. And also all the individual minds, all the individual minds possess being. Therefore, there is one thing that permeates it all, being. <coughs> now, look here. Notice what we're saying, though. Let's go back to what we're saying. If there is such a thing, if anything exists at all, if there is such a thing as being, and if it's a cause, if it exists in any way, right? It exists in any way, it must have some power. There must be some activity that proceeds from it. Now, in this activity, there must be something most interesting which we're now going to apply to everything that we were doing. <coughs> we touched on it a moment ago, and that is the source of its per perfection. Do you agree we said the cause of the perfection of that relationship between Manny and Sarah must be in terms of the relationship itself, the degree to which they can actualize that idea they have in themselves, which they voluntarily accept and voluntarily act out, then all their activity is in respect to it, all the power they can have then acts out and flows through them, and therefore they can be said to have a relationship based upon a common, a common broad-based plan and purpose. Well, then, in order to gain that kind of relationship, they must continuously, in one way or the other, intuitively, in one way or the other, always go back and reflect on the source of their own existence. Must they not? They have to return to the source of their existence. That's the idea. to the degree then that they can return to the source of their existence. That's also the cause of their existence. And we said that was the final cause. So you know what that means? That means, <coughs> curiously enough, if being then exists, it must have some power. It must have some activity that proceeds from it. And that activity must be to return to its, its own origins, for that's the very basis of its perfection. But in that moment of returning, you see, in that very moment of returning, in that moment of returning, In that moment of returning, say in that moment of returning, it then, in returning, returns to its source. Finds its perfection there.
and discovers something quite remarkable. Would you agree that something is interesting about this? And that is that we said before that when they return to the cause of their own existence, which is the final cause, what they really <clears throat> come to is the very idea that started out the entire relationship. In that sense then, that idea existed potentially there all the time. Therefore they discover right, that here is the very idea, the goal of reversion. They discover in one sense that in this entire development, gaining the power, acting out the activity, that they return to their source and discover that part of themselves never left its source. Mary, pardon me, Manny and Sarah, what do they discover? as they perfect their relationship. Only one thing, that it was there from the beginning. And now what they've done is actualized it, they've actualized it, and therefore it emerges for them to be seen, to be seen, experienced directly, and therefore they can then realize that everything they did was already implicit in the first act. So when they return to its source and find their perfection, they also discover <coughs> the source of their own existence. And therefore, in that sense, all right, they discover the source of their own existence, then this is nothing other than the knower engaging in an activity of knowing, <coughs> which then becomes the object of what is known. But the knower then discovers, what does he discover? What does she discover? The same thing which is that the knower in acting out, right, coming to know, has to go through a certain process of knowing, activity, and then comes to the object that is known, which is nothing other than the very uh, condition of their existence. And therefore, there's no difference. And therefore, the knower, the knowing, and the known are one. So we can do it. How can we say that? How can we say that? Well, Manny is the knower. <coughs> he wants this relationship. Huh? He's now going to go through a process to get to know her, and he wants her to get to know him. All right. Well, is there any difference between those two? They're both knowers, they're both going through an activity of knowing, and what it is they're going to come to reach in their knowledge is nothing other than that which they intend to be. Which is the object of knowledge, which is really themselves, that's what they want to be, that defines their existence. It allows them to see themselves in a very fun fundamental way, more perfectly. Now, let's just do something here now. And let's go back into this.
He has an idea of the way he wants to be. So he engages in an activity so that he can realize the reality of that idea. To that degree, all of the activity that he's engaged in, right, the activity itself, and the power of that activity, does nothing other than to bring about the realization of that idea. That is contemplation. <clears throat> He's fixed, he has fixed his mind on an object the actions that he engages in the actions that he engages in with Sarah all of those actions are to do nothing other than but to make concrete, to be able to realize in front of him, with him, the reality of that idea. Now, suppose for the moment that that idea is the way he most wants to be. Then the idea is not something alien from himself, but he's now realizing an idea of the way he most wants to be. She in turn, right, she in turn now, must see in those actions that that's the way he most wants to be and she can expect therefore if that remains that way that that can be the basis a natural basis for maintaining a certain curious kind of relationship that is it may not be an imposed idea it may simply be the way he and she may most want to be. Then, the idea is then, their, mo their ideal, their own ideal. Therefore, we can just change this, becomes their ideal. Then the relation itself is a contemplation. It's the basis then of a, a, a fundamental way of being. And a natural way in which we can say brings about a higher degree, a more interesting degree, a higher degree of one's own perfection. Now what we're going to do now is go back and change that one word. This is mind and this is soul. then we then have a mind. Implicit in that is that there should be some way in which we can be most ideally what we want to be, even though it's not a blueprint. 
that presupposes then that that's going to be the cause of our actions. To try to develop that means then that we have to allow mind, right? we have to allow mind, see here it is now, we have to allow mind to help us be the way we most want to be. Now, whatever you look to at that moment, it's not, it's not an, an artificial idea. Because if it is, you'll reject it. Right? So, by working through this idea, which is an ideal, right, it means then we have to then gain <coughs> access to the fullest participation into mind, our mind. Because whatever it contains potentially, whatever it contains potentially, if it is in the sense that we're now describing, it is the way we most want to be. So, whatever richness there is in such a dream, right, then we want to access that potential and allow it to emerge through the fullest part participation into mind. You can see the same dynamics in relationship to body and soul as you can see in relationships all around you. All kinds of relationships. Not necessarily romance, any, any, any meaningful relationship. And through it, let's see whether this is true now, all right? Pulling to a conclusion. If there are meaningful relationships, Let us say this is a meaningful relationship. Then that meaningful relationship would then provide a way of gaining access to the fullest participation into mind. Now, What's most interesting about Proclus in Plato, especially Proclus, all right? <coughs> he has a word we translate as understanding. It's a Greek word, dianoia. For Proclus, he says, that the activity of dianoia, which I prefer to use rather than the word understanding, and this is why. He says, the one must learn to exercise the dianoia. And the only way you can understand, see, the mind has several functions. One of it is to understand. It's one of its functions. So if we want to gain access to the fullest participation <coughs> into mind, and if mind in, must include as one of its parts understanding, then what does he mean by understanding? He says, it is only through understanding relationships that you can awaken the dianoia. It's only through studying relationships that you can understand the awaken, the dianoia. That's an interesting thesis. Now, this is a relationship, soul the body. 
mind to mind to soul. They're all relationships. If if the dynamics of if the dynamics that we need to explore to talk about the relationship with soul and mind are not any different than talking about Manny and Sarah, then we can work back and forth talking about things we're most familiar with, shift the language, and then talk about mind and soul. Because soul for the Greek, remember is not some ethereal thing floating around above the, just a little bit below the ceiling. <clears throat> it is that within you that plans, commands, and takes care of yourself and seeks your benefit. So whatever it is you see within yourself that plans and commands because it cares, Right? There's a part of us that cares for ourselves. There's a part of us that commands us to do certain things. Part of us that plans all kinds of things to try to bring about a better way of being. That's what the Greeks call soul. With one addition, of course, maybe a couple of other additions, but it also brings with it, it also brings with it life. Right? Source of life also. So therefore, in seeking an understanding of relationships, you have to engage yourself in the nature of the soul, because these are the three things that are involved. <coughs> that presupposes there must be some mind operating behind the soul, if the soul plans and commands and seeks its own care and benefit. Well then. There must be something behind it that it relies upon to make those plans, right? And that presupposes there must be mind. That presupposes we must be in touch with mind itself. Now, that means then that we can now go back to the beginning and say we can study one another, learn all we can about relations, relationships, knowing full well that relationships that you discover is going to allow you to see things in general, which you can then apply to the realm of soul and mind, soul and body. And by doing that then you will begin to, you will be forced to deal with one basic issue, which is this issue here which is, what is the way in which we can be most what we want to be? That means being open to it, that means studying relationships, and that means now, can you treat yourself, can you relate to yourself as you do to those with whom you relate. Most positively, most meaningfully. Because if you do it, you're using your mind. Well, then, then you're appreciating the mind. Ah! Now, if that brings you to appreciate mind, and we go the next step and say, but it looked like that there was something common behind mind and, and soul, we can say, wait a minute then. How does the mind and soul, especially now, say, how does the mind and soul relate? Oh, we got a lot of information on that. Let me go the next step and say, how does the individual mind relate to mind itself? But didn't we not say that mind itself, and particular minds, there presupposes there is some realm of something that participates or is included called being. So therefore we can talk about how does mind relate to being?
doesn't make any difference. Whichever things you see in a relationship, the same set of relationships that are common to all relationships could be equally binding on that. Therefore, the doorway into metaphysics is pick up the study of relationships, and what you're going to find is you can apply it in all cases, whether you go to the highest, because behind being, let's see if we can go with one more step. We touched on it once before. Let's see if we can pull it together. We found something common to mind and soul, and that was being. And then we said, look here, this being then must exist, has some power and activity, right? didn't we? And we said, good heavens, when, when one returns, this returning to it, which is true in all relationships, then one experiences a unity or oneness. And that's when the knower and the known and the knowing are the same, one. Well, <coughs> now we can say, wait a minute, how is being then related to oneness? And then we can go the last step and say, hey, how does this curious thing called oneness relate to the one? Oh, what are you doing though? Whatever you do, remember, the first thing you want to do is work out the relationships. And this is a model for all the relationships. So, if we have a hierarchy, the one or the highest good, oneness, and being, intelligence, Vitality, or power, right? soul, all right? and soul and body. We can talk about the relationship between these two. We can talk about the relationship between these. <coughs> these, these doesn't make any difference. The same vocabulary that you'll be using will be the same. The same vocabulary will be used between all of those possible <coughs> grades of being. And what guides all of these is that for each one of these, there's a return to the source, a return to the source, a return to the source, a return to the source. So, our most fundamental way of being, which is intuitively, when you're in a better place, right, that intuitive sense of a better way to be, it's nothing other than mind. You participate then to a higher degree and bring about further perfection. That allows then the soul to return through each one of these levels to an ultimate, and that is called the grades of reality. Thank you. I don't even think I have anything else on the next sheet. Nope, the last sheet. I wanted to ask you. Um, I can't read. I wanted to ask you. Um, in the way you were talking, it sounded like being took on a certain characteristic that when it you turned or returned upon itself, that <coughs> it was like that was when being occurred. But that doesn't, that's not what I was, well, in my own mind, I thought being was a certain existence. You know, like this exists, that exists. But it, uh, I, I got the idea that as you were talking, being didn't occur until you participated. Did I miss something? I don't know whether you missed it. Uh, the view you have is a view you have. Uh, whether you can reconcile it with this yeah, is, was, is, is yeah. a, an interesting task. But here, uh, uh, you see, 
the word maybe that'll help you here. Uh, intelligence, another word for intelligence, is mind. But we don't participate. We, if we don't return to find our source, are we then? Are we then being? Are we then in the state of being? If we don't do that. Well, well, <coughs> pardon me, before you do that, these are dashed because they're not three. See, if being, if the fundamental level of reality was only being but had no intelligence, then it would be dumb. And if it didn't have any vitality, it'd be dead. But if intelligence, right, didn't have any being, it would be illusory, right? And without vitality, it would be very dull. Right? Vitality, without intelligence, without some kind of intelligence guiding it, it would just be uh, chaos. But it still would have to have some kind of being in order to be at all. Therefore, <coughs> uh, these are hyphenated. They're hyphenated because they're inseparable. They're inse you, can you can distinguish them through reasoning but in themselves, they're inseparable. And uh, um, see, this would be uh, on this level. Um, the mind of God the mind of God, with all the vitality of that mind, right, and existing, if you like theological language, you know. Um, and, of course, one of the, see, one of the interesting things would be <coughs> wherever you <coughs> participate, or however you participate in this, <coughs> to the degree that you can, then that changes this too, doesn't it? Your everyday human relationships. Aren't necessarily, because what did we say before? The higher you go, each one of these contain within itself preeminently those qualities which it shares with others. And uh, you could then put this whole thing, if, if it were possible, to say to have this, uh, the, way, the way one most wants to be is the result of having uh, participated in this, then in whatever relationships you have, with whoever or whatever it is you're involved in, that would be quite demanding in one sense, yet simple in another, because you're bringing, bringing in higher levels of reality. And uh, makes things a lot easier, of course. That's why words are important, right? To share words is love. Same thing, love, sharing words so that you can then be the way you most want to be. Oh. I, I mean, my question is probably even more simpler than you. Hope so. <laughs> no, maybe just more elementary. Does the soul, does the soul have its own existence apart from mind at any time, or 
it doesn't necessarily have that kind of relationship, maybe even to a very elementary degree. Yes. Well, I'm sure glad when people ask yes or no questions. Okay, so it does. <laughs> because 50% <laughs> of the time, you're right. <laughs> no. Uh, if you call what we're calling soul, then Participates that already mind. participates to some degree in yeah. mind. That admits of higher and higher degrees. Even a cell, an organism, at some level it looks like it may direct itself towards some goal. Well, takes, care of itself. takes care of itself and may in some sense, if it has some kind of direction, might even have some rudimentary function of mind. So mind looks to oneness then? It has an idea of oneness such that... It is a oneness, see? It is a oneness. Yeah, this is a oneness. Oh, I see. This is I a oneness. Said that. <coughs> because mm -hmm. if you try to consider each one of these by themselves, then, then it looks like here you have something dead and dumb. Mm -hmm. Here you'd have something that would be alive, that, that would have intelligence but would be dead and wouldn't exist. And if it only had vitality and no intelligence, it would be chaotic and also wouldn't have any, any existence. These words are chosen because of this basic model. See, this model. Returning to its source, wherever we had it before I erased it. Right. At that moment, returning to its source, is it likely there's some recognition If there is some recognition, if one recognizes the source of one's existence, if one never recognizes in that experience uh, a great deal of uh, joy, enthusiasm, vitality, then you have in one experience these three things. The experience of luminosity uh, numinosity, luminosity, radiance, is the same as this. One reaches, one recognizes a higher sense of reality or being in that experience, in the transfiguration experience. One recognizes it's part and parcel of mind. One recognizes that it is alive, fully alive, in the highest sense. Therefore, it's one experience within which you can find, make, you can make these distinctions, but they don't exist apart in reality. Like, you can't go in there and tie one up tie another one up with bows and send it to a colleague. But by allowing, allowing these distinctions to be made in reflection, then you can make more and more distinctions, you can understand it more fully, and that will bring you back to understand relationships, which is the practice of dianoia, which is what Proclus calls true understanding. And now in the same way, <coughs> when we were doing dreams, you see, dreams come from the mind of the soul, doesn't it? And that helps us, does it not, return to become the way we most want to be? That's what it does, self-requiring, self-reflections, doesn't it? So, some people do it through dreams, meditations, a large, a large variety of ways. So that was my experiment to see whether I could bring you into this stuff through everyday relations. Thank you. Thank you. Very pleased to be able to do it. I hope it was clear. The real point then, you see, is that metaphysics is not an arbitrary invention. <coughs> its statements and its principles emerge in and through relationships. And then you begin to see it, ah, you can apply it here, and here, and here, and then there's one set of terms which can go, one set of terms. Or as we sometimes say, relations are constant, terms may vary.
you were using that really cut the relationship between Manny and Sarah. It seems like Sarah and, and Manny are independent. No, it's not a relationship between. Uh, of course, I don't know what you mean when you say relationship between mind being and soul. Be, be the realm of being, mind and, mind and soul. Yes. That In that sense, then. you're focusing on the idea of being as existence. Mm -hmm. And that there's something that is in the mind of mind. see the difficulty you're having now, because mind depends, uh, soul depends upon mind. Okay. Mind has a power, that's why it's not reversible. Soul doesn't have a power it gives to mind, mind has a power it gives to soul, mm -hmm. gives it the power to know. Right. Therefore it is its higher cause. That's why I didn't, there was a part here that I didn't understand in terms of Manny and Sarah, that it, it seemed like it uh, there was some there was some there was independence there rather than that kind of dependency of primary to the secondary. What kind of independence are you pointing to? Well, I thought you mentioned that when Sarah turned in, that she also has an idea in her mind, which I thought was came from her. Of which then she would turn off. But in order to receive these advances, she has to be able to receive okay. that. And that means there is something within her to which there corresponds a basis for a relationship. <coughs> Good. Thank you. <laughs> 